Good evening and aloha everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's Tuesday night. It's time for Tuning Up with Iggy and Dave. Uh, he's already spent 30 hours at work and it's only Tuesday night. Dave, how are you? <laughs> I'm, I don't look that bad, do I, Iggy? I, was, <laughs> I, I, I feel well rested. You, you always look great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been a great week. I'm really excited the directions we're headed in currently. Got some good news from the city. Got some good news from the state. Vaccines are coming along. I am starting to think that that bright light at the end of the tunnel is not a train barreling towards us. Um, so I'm feeling good. How are you, Iggy? I'm doing good. And uh, speaking of very, very bright light, we have our <laughs> special guest tonight, Clark Bride, bandmaster of the Royal Hawaiian Aloha. Band and so many other things that you're involved with. Aloha. Great to have you. Aloha. Thank you, Iggy, Dave. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Wonderful to have you. Really appreciate so, it. So, you know, um, I live nearby uh, Blaisdell Concert mm -hmm. Hall, mm -hmm. and I see a lot of our kupuna uh, very, very happy when they're there, uh, not just because they just got their vaccine, but also because they get to hear the Royal Hawaiian Band uh, week long. Uh, how is it uh, for you and your musicians to kind of bring a little bit of joy to our kupuna? Oh, it's the best. Um, I think that's the purpose of our musicianship lives, it, to, to change the people when they enter our musical environment, to leave a better person because of what they witnessed. And that's, that's why we're there. Um, the Queen's Hospital is providing, as you know, shots for Kupuna at the Blaisdell, so partnering with the city. And we, being a department in the city, uh, they asked us to just provide some kind of ambient music. Uh, not anything too loud, because we don't want to interfere with what they're doing in the actual uh, Blaisdell Center. Uh, but as they come out and wait to be observed and rest, the Royal Hawaiian Band, we broken up into small ensembles because we cannot perform as a full group and almost everybody is going through some form of that already. Uh, so we'll rotate uh, four or five different ensembles um, every Wednesday through Sunday and just provide some kind of music, most of which they'll recognize, for them to hear live music while getting a shot to save my life, hopefully, with the vaccine. And uh, the appreciation from everybody coming out is, is humbling. It, it brings back to memory again why we do what we do and the fact that we get to do that now during a pandemic is special. It keeps our guys working. It keeps our guys on, you know, on, on, their, on their chops going and they can stay in shape, but it's purposeful. It's not just to perform for nothing, but they are serving a cause greater than all of us combined. So I think it's working out. Um, it, it's, it's a little, little time consuming at times, but it's worth it because we get to hit many, many people. We are averaging, I believe, close to about 500 people that we are servicing every day with some kind of music, Hawaiian music, classical music, band standards, jazz, a swing, whatever it is, um, every day out there. It's a, it's a joy, it's an honor and a joy. Yeah, a lot of uh, my friends from the mainland, they would text me and they would say, hey, uh, did you hear about Yo-Yo Ma playing for um, you know, his uh, crowd after getting his, his test, or no, vaccine, excuse me. And I would reply and say, well, but the Royal Hawaiian band has been doing that for a couple of months. They were going to well, I was in. going to say, I, I saw these new he news headlines as well. And, you know, they said Yo-Yo Ma gives an impromptu performance. I just have to point out, and, you know, as a, as a leader of a band, there's nothing impromptu about showing up to a vaccine with a cello. You have it on your back. You have to carry it there. It was somewhat planned. Can you talk about just the planning that went into place to have your musicians there safely and and on, you know, that's a, a lot of days every single week to be there. Yeah, so an immense yeah. undertaking, I'd imagine. You know, um, um, months of planning uh, because we have to we have to rearrange everything, basically restructure the whole process of, of how we do things. Um, and then when we thought we had it down, we had to meet with medical professionals mm -hmm. and the union and administration. Yeah, you're laughing, you, you, you know where I'm going. So that took an added amount of time, um, but we all came to agreement that we, we thought it would be best to do no more than five members. Mm -hmm. So there are some naturally created ensembles that the, the musicians are used to doing, yep. woodwind quintets or 
brass quintets, saxophone ensembles, etc. cetera. Uh, but then we had to figure out how to get enough of a support, i.e. chairs, tents, um, delineator markers, mm -hmm. uh, signs, uh, hand sanitizers. Um, when somebody's sitting down, somebody else can't use the chair, so we have to have the right kind of disinfectant spray that can be sprayed and then evaporated after a certain amount of time. How long can we really play being wind instrument players outdoors that we, we think is safe for them? And then how much time do we have in between each group? So that we have to plan all that out. And then we work with our field coordinator to assign each ensemble to a different time. And you have to arrive at this time because we don't want them hanging around too early to be exposed to each other. And then they have to play and then leave early. And then the, in the meantime, while four of them are at the Blaisdell, we still have maybe two or three either at the zoo or at Oral Hawaiian Hotel or at the Moana Hotel or in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So that, that becomes a logistical challenge, um, but we got great guys. We have two or three different vehicles going out in different locations, some chairs here, <laughs> some signs here, some markers here, always PPE wherever we're going. Um, so it was a challenge, but it's on a roll and it seems to be working right now. Yeah. Yeah. Great. A Great. lot of things that Jay, Dave, you must be familiar with, all this uh, non-artistic protocol. Yeah, it has just, I, I don't know if you're feeling this as well. I mean, it sounds like from your, uh, from your description of this, but we're, we've been tossed into this. There are, are now 12 steps before we give, even get to the point of what we're going to play. Uh, uh, and so it has been a, a little bit of a challenge, um, but you know, I think we have some really great city partners who have uh, shown how important it is that we take these precautions, but then we also find a way to continue providing music to the community, because that is our mission at the end of the day, a shared mission between our, our organizations. Very so. important mission, we feel. Yeah. Clark. Iggy, uh, I, well, sorry. Yes, I think we please, should we should please. talk about the wine we this should. evening um, yes. because, as you'll probably notice, we are we had orange wine back in October for <laughs> Halloween. But that sounds scary. This is not orange wine. This is not green wine. This is green beer. And who made that beer? I made that this green beer. Show proof. Uh, the proof is in your the, fingers. The proof is uh, indeed <laughs> in, my, in my fingers a little bit here. Thank you, Donard. Um, yes, uh, tomorrow is the high holy day of St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I am in, you know, in a, a good Irish Catholic from Chicago, the oh, Shirish, oh. as we're called. And um, <laughs> we dye our river green. And so yes, I decided tonight uh, we, we should at least dye our beer green. Uh, and to, you know, say slancha and I, to, I haven't to had have... a chance to, to uh, try it. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we will have to, I will after the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. How, uh, how, it's been one year, right? Yeah. And when did you arrive here? Or when did you start working? I, first day work? I arrived in Honolulu on March 6th and mm. started on March 10th. So this is my okay. second St. So Patrick's second Day Saint away Patrick's. from Chicago. But the winner of our trivia question will not unfortunately get to drink your beer <laughs> we could arrange that i could make a special batch of green beer uh for the winner but tonight uh thanks to our friends at hosser wine terry uh over at hosser we have a wonderful spanish wine that's not green a caro from uh 2017 i believe it's a blend uh you yes. have to pick up the back and <laughs> and read it for oh, me. Oh my, I just saw the eye doctor yesterday. <laughs> and so I'm trying out those uh, new prescription. It's a blend of Merlot, Tempranillo, Syrah, and Monastrel. Wonderful. Nice. And well done. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, the winner uh, this yes. evening uh, can, will have that bottle delivered to them. Uh, and the question this evening that you can text the answer to the number below here on the screen uh, is what's the question again? Or, or well, you, I think we decided that uh, Clark would be the perfect person to perfect. Ask. <laughs> okay. Okay. If we're all up to it, it's a three-part question, and it's involving the Royal Hawaiian Band. So we have. Ha I'm the twenty-second bandmaster. Who was the most prominent bandmaster of the Royal Hawaiian Band? After you. <laughs> That's one, thank you. Two, what year did he start? And three, how many years was he the bandmaster of the Royal Hawaiian Band? 
Again, who was the most prominent bandmaster of the Royal Hawaiian Band? There were 22 of us. Two, what year did he start? And three, how long was he bandmaster of the Royal Hawaiian Band? So we'll see if we have a winner. But you know, the reason why I asked uh, um, you, uh, Dave, how long you've uh, been here has been one year, right? Yeah. And so one year and, and the pandemic started. And so uh, one may guess that you might not have had the opportunity to uh, enjoy or appreciate or savor all that Hawaii has to offer. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't talked about it, but I thought <clears throat> maybe not today, but in the coming weeks, I would invite our viewers to call or text the number. And, and, and I have this new segment called uh, To Dave to with Dave. Aloha, oh, oh, which nice. means <laughs> things that you think Dave should enjoy now that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Nice. It could be a favorite dish that's very popular in Hawaii. It could be a favorite hike. Not a business, because we're not here to promote businesses, although sometimes it depends if they're very, uh, you know. <laughs> if there was a good Irish pub, I would visit. <laughs> uh, and I hear there's a few, so. There are a few. Um, but anyway, uh, something to kind of think about. So, you know, again, it would be called To Dave with Aloha. Anything that you think nice. Dave ought to uh, discover about our beautiful islands? Well, I would say we could start tonight, but, you know, I will say that as soon as things reopened, the first time, and this must have been back in June, May, perhaps, um, I got a notification that the Royal Hawaiian Band was playing at the Bishop Museum and uh, decided that on a Sunday afternoon, my wife and I would go. We, we hadn't been to the Bishop before. I had to hear the Royal Hawaiian Band, and we had a chance to meet. So yes. may, maybe that have been, would have been one of the things on your list that you had recommended to me. But uh, it was really wonderful to to experience that. And that was actually, I think, before I had actually heard any of the musicians of the HSO play. A few of our mm -hmm. musicians were, were playing mm -hmm. that day, and so I got to hear them for the first time. But I think it really speaks to the number of partnerships and the flexibility and dedication you have to, to serve the, the entire city here. It's really, it's phenomenal. Uh, well, we need everybody working uh, and playing and serving the, the people of Hawaii with music. Um, it's part of a, a, a big part of our culture. It's, it's who we are. And it, it spans every type of music, really, not just one. And to see you there, to meet you, it was great. Um, the, the grounds are beautiful. Um, and they, they are there for historic purposes, and they have a lot of links to the monarchy as well. Uh, but it's, it was one of the initial times that we got to perform out there at the Bishop Museum. And there may have been three people there. And I think you were two of them. So, <laughs> so I think you know, it, there, there weren't a lot. Um, some, well, again, they come and then they go to someplace else. So we don't, we're not geared out for a concert or a gathering, but just to provide some ambiance. If they choose to stay, great. But uh, it was nice uh, meeting you. And I believe our members got a chance to meet you for the first time as yep. well at that time, some of them. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about how the relationship works between the symphony and the band because we we share a couple of members uh, in common and we've found rehearsal schedules and performance schedules that works and you know i from the from the musicians that i know you know it's such a, a wonderful addition both the symphony and the band to being able to be a full-time musician here in hawaii how many members do we share approximately <laughs> Currently, I believe uh, four or five of them are more full time yeah. members and anywhere from two or three or four at times a part time members. Yeah. Um, and it, it's taken some initiative to continue to get the schedules to work. Um, you know, musicians all want to pr practice at the same time. <laughs> but if they're both going on, then something's got to give. So um, it's it's taken some opportunity. It, it allows us an opportunity to have every working musician performs sometime when they're able to so the other group is not affected. Yeah. And that's not always the case, but we've worked it out. Yeah. And we've come to some agreements, some changes. I think the biggest word is just flexibility, being flexible. We want the symphony to succeed. At, I mean, it, it doesn't, end of story. We want the symphony to succeed. And our guys, it playing in the symphony are great musicians. We Absolutely. want them to succeed. 
Um, I, I believe the symphony wants the Royal Hawaiian Band to succeed as well. Um, <laughs> so I, we, can, we can both <laughs> confirm that, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, <laughs> um, and um, you know, we have a, a set schedule and at times it's very flexible. Yeah. So we've been able to work it out. Um, and it's important. We need both services continuing from the classical perspective or from the Hawaiian perspective for our people here in Hawaii. And one of the things that has been a surprise to me, uh, I guess it shouldn't come as a surprise because I geographically knew how far away Hawaii was from any other major metropolitan city. But mm -hmm. you know, when, when we have a musician who takes leave or we need extra musicians, it takes a lot to get high quality musicians here in Hawaii. And so having a partner like the band is, is really a, a huge asset for us and one of the reasons that we can be successful here. So, oh, yeah, it, so in, in, in addition to the full-time members, you know, our guys are playing every day. Um, we average 350 concerts a year. Um, and it, they're constantly serving in some capacity. So they're good. You know, they're really good musicians. Um, they've worked hard to get there. And uh, some of them have this opportunity to perform with the likes of an Iggy or under a Dave. You know, I mean, that, that's an honor for them, too. Yeah. And, and, and I see them because uh, sometimes they'll be coming right from a Royal Hawaiian Band uh, service and they're in their uniform and just in time to change from white, mostly, to, to black for <laughs> us. Um, so the... The bride family in Hawaii is mighty, mm. Uh, mm. And, and the Royal Hawaiian Man is only one of the um, occupations that you have. But as, as Dave would say at the beginning of, uh, of our talk story, um, he would ask our guest, please take us to the beginning. And the beginning is whatever you want it to be. Uh, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's a great, great question, great point. Um, I was born and raised in a musical family. Um, actually, maybe just my dad. My mom played the radio, <laughs> but she was the architect behind the scenes. My dad, mm -hmm. um, self-taught pianist, uh, also played oboe and, um, and clarinet and percussion in the band growing up. Uh, but he, his passion for changing lives through the art, an excellent art of theater, um, we witnessed as youth. So we were constantly exposed to musicals, all of Rogers and Hammerstein's musicals, uh, from as, as early as I can remember. Um, and we would also be witness to my dad playing piano um, and playing for either his students or prominent Hawaiian artists as well. So we learned all the Hawaiian songs that way. Um, and we, were just, we just kept going. And when I was in high school, I joined the band and enjoyed it. Um, and at that time, I had to make a choice. I love sports. Uh, everybody else grew taller. I grew shorter in a way. So I said no to sports. But and you did do sports. I did do sports when I was younger. I loved it. Um, but at that point, when I, uh, others were better than me, I said, maybe I should go into music. It kind of worked out uh, a little bit now. But at that point, um, decided to study it, uh, went into music at UH, uh, became a band director at Waimanalo Elementary and Intermediate. Uh, and I was a part-time teacher when I first started in 1987. Uh, I had 12 kids in the band and they were all Hawaiian. And I, they, had, they had to give me English and some other classes to make it work. Um, four years later, when I left to go to Kamehameha, we had 150 people in the band. Women. Um, and it was, it was a, a, a beautiful testament to the talent of Hawaiian youth. Uh, natural, just natural musicians. Taught at Kamehameha, loved that quite a bit uh, for 14 years. I got to meet some great people. Some of them are helping us presently to kick off this program. Um, and I also did some ministry work. I was the performing arts director with New Hope Christian Fellowship. Um, and then when the Royal Hawaiian Band bandmaster position came available, we had some suggestions, some people maybe requesting, and I went for it and then been blessed with um, Mayor Carlisle, who hired me initially. He did a two-year term. Um, Kirk Caldwell 
took over for him, continued then uh, for eight years, and Mayor Blind Giardi just reappointed me again. So I'm continuing now my 11th year as bandmaster of the Royal Hawaiian Band. And you also did some... Uh, you wonderful. You also served in the Army National Guard Band? I correct? did, yes. Oh, you did your homework. <laughs> Um, I, didn't, I, I, I thought you, you knew so many things, but I, thought, I think you, you missed something. So. Oh, thank you. Uh, what else did I do? <laughs> I, I have to ask you. You always find something. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be calling you up and ask you what else happened. Um, yeah, in 1979, I joined the National Guard band, and my dad was in the band uh, at that time. I, uh, I graduated from high school, 17 years old. Ten days later, I was at basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Now I had a, a great upbringing, very comforting, very supportive, thrown into basic training <laughs> at 17 years old at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri was quite an experience. I went through that, um, was able to help pay my way through college because of being in the National Guard at that time. And that's, that's why we did it originally. But ended up loving it, did it for 21 years. Wow. Retired, um, so I have some benefits now. Um, I'm coming of age to get retirement from them this year. Uh, that, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But Halekoa, Navy Exchange, Commissaries, those are all part they of all the perks now. Well. I love it. Yeah. Those are the perks now. Yeah. How do you go from singing Rogers and Hammerstein at home to basic training? <laughs> uh, it, it, it wasn't easy. I, I didn't enjoy it. It was the worst time in my life. It really was. Um, I never knew those kind of people existed, <laughs> um, honestly. Uh, but there was something in it that was competitive as well, because I had to get through it. It had nothing to do with music, um, but I had to get through it. So I learned a lot. Um, I cried a lot, honestly. I, I cried a lot. I valued the letters from home, <clears throat> and I couldn't wait to get back. <laughs> and then when I got back here, it was rejuvenated, and I realized why we did it, because I played with the uh, 25th Division full-time army band. You do that for about two months as well. And that's when it came back. Yeah, I did this for this purpose. I love making music. Mm. I love being a part of doing something to help others through music. So then it kind of, oh, okay, you're okay. <laughs> when I grew up in France uh, in the 80s, uh, the military service was mandatory, and I didn't do it because I left for the U.S. and I was a full-time college student. And so if, we're, if you were living abroad, uh, being a student, uh, you didn't have to uh, do it. But my, my brother, uh, older than me, um, did his military service and, and he is a, a French Navy Reserve. Mm -hmm. And he's also mm -hmm. a, you know amateur pianist. But uh, I, I, there was always things that he values uh, from uh, serving in, in the mm -hmm. French Navy. Dave, uh, do you have any in your family or any military uh, uh, colors? Not, not so much. I, you know, I have an uncle that played in one of the military bands, a, a trombone player, I believe mm -hmm. it was. Um, but uh, no, not a whole lot of military in my family. Yeah. So um, you mentioned, um, let's see, the, um, uh, the, the Army National Guard Band. You were at some point at uh, Kamehameha schools mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, we're not here to talk about the Kamehameha schools, but it, it, the school, you know, plays such a, a big role in Hawaii. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Very well said. Um, not only for Hawaiians and the culture, but I, I believe for Hawaii in general. Um, it, the, the, the school and its resources has created such a service to Hawaiian youth um, and a service, I, I believe, now spreading out to varying communities as well. And I, it was interesting, being, being a Hawaiian um, and working at Waimanalo School initially, working with Hawaiian students, um, and then going to Kamehameha mm -hmm. and working with Hawaiian students there, and now being part of the Royal Hawaiian Band, working with Hawaiian music, uh, Hawaiian community, um, it's, it's really brought me back to the understanding of how important Kamehameha Schools is. And not only uh, was, but is. And will continue, I believe, to have even more of an impact. My two sons uh, went there. I was not able to go there, unfortunately, but my wife 
teaches there, is now a 32-year member, has taught some wonderful students in the past. Um, she has a choir that's, that's doing well, although now they haven't been able to sing for quite some time. But does she still teach the choir somehow? She still teaches somehow. They do some virtual performances every now and then. She'll get them together with masks separated or have them record something and send it in and work on it digitally. Uh, so she's, she, and she does a lot of ukulele. You know, she can keep them going that way, but she's still there. Uh, so we've seen the benefit that that school has allowed all of us to, to, to be a part of. And, um, and I, I think it's gonna just continue even more so in the future. Right, and, and Grateful. Dave, sorry, Dave, you, um, here's a good point to, to bring that the HSO is equally committed to our youth? Yes, I want to, before, that is such a great segue, but I have to ask because uh, we, we have someone behind the camera who, you know, <laughs> feeds me questions and uh -huh. um, you may be at a disadvantage because I, I believe you know him quite well. So <laughs> um, I understand your wife has also has won an award recently. Uh -huh. uh, she did win a Na Hoku Hano Hano award recently, yes. Uh, we're all very proud of the work that, <laughs> that, uh, that, that she's doing. How did we know that? How did we find that? <laughs> I have a source. I have a source. It, yeah. it was um, meant to be a, a Christmas album uh, with the, the students and partnering with past uh, Kamehameha students in the choir who are now doing really well yeah. in the Hawaiian community. Um, and they put it, I believe, into the category of uh, spiritual, uh, mm -hmm. some kind of spiritual category. Um, and they won. She wasn't expecting it at, at all, but it was neat that the kids get a chance to be part of creating this, this piece, this project that won a Nahoku Hano Hano Award. Uh, so they're, they're, they're very happy about that, yeah. Uh, and if I could just continue for just a bit. Please. Uh, they, uh, her choir was the original performing choir on Lilo and Stitch. The very really? first Lilo and Stitch being made, yeah. Um, the entire choir, they came down Disney came down and um, recorded them here. Uh, they were on several tunes, three or four different tunes. Uh, and you know, it, it, she, she loved it. It was great, of course, Disney, right? Right, yes. And that, that, sh that movie continues to be played. Uh, and every time it's played, it's, it helps mm -hmm. the family, it helps the school, <laughs> resources to still come in. But uh, it's, a, it's an honor, I think, that um, she appreciates just being up at Kamehameha schools in, in some form to work with these Hawaiian kids. That's yeah. wonderful. That was actually ended up being a, 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 a better segue than I was even it expecting was. with yes. the Nahoku Hano Hano Award as well. So as Iggy was referencing, uh, about a week and a half ago now, we launched uh, the, we relaunched, I suppose we should say, the youth talent pool and rebranded it uh, Young Stars, Nahoku Opio. Um, and oh. we have the opportunity uh, to provide uh, class of 2020 and 2021. So high school seniors that graduated last year and are still here in Hawaii, weren't able to go off to college because of the pandemic, and then students this year, um, the opportunity to perform with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra oh, as beautiful. soloists. Beautiful. Uh, and those performances will take place in May and now June as well. Uh, at an outdoor performance at a venue close to Diamond Head. Um, <laughs> not allowed to say anything more than that at the moment. Uh, but it's really, you know, I had heard that this, the youth talent pool, that yes. for decades, the opportunity, the people, uh, the young people who were able to perform with the HSO and what that did for them and their careers and, and for the community, um, you know, we have so many in our orchestra, Nancy Masaki and Kim Kiabu, uh, people who have won this as, as, as children and um, gone on to do just marvelous things. So we thought Perfect. now was the best time to relaunch this uh, because of the, just the opportunities that so many of these students have missed out on the last two years. And so if they want to find out more information, what did they do? MyHSO.org, our landing page, will take you right to the information for that. The application and audition is all digital. We won't be having those in person, but uh, we have a, a panel of five judges, two from the symphony, uh, an associate, uh, a conductor and uh, kind of a celebrity judge that uh -huh. we're excited to announce coming up here. Um, and yeah, we, we look forward to showcasing the wonderful talent that is of Hawaii here. It's wonderful. Beautiful. I actually, beautiful. Um, 
um, saw not too long ago an old, well, <laughs> she'll be upset with me, but uh, <laughs> a, um, um, a recording, a video recording of my wife uh, when she was younger. Um, she was a, um, a winner of the youth talent pool. Was she? And uh, performed uh, a movement of the uh, Shostakovich piano concerto, and the conductor was Henry Miyamura. Nice, yes. Um, and so it was, uh, it was very nice to see, uh, because, you know, uh, I, I came in 97, and for me, the symphony is just from 97 on, and, and you know, I forget <laughs> that uh, I have to be humbled and remember that, um, you know, it's over 100 years old. The, the, the Honolulu Symphony slash Hawaii Symphony is over 100 years old, and it's uh, quite uh, an... Um, not a treat, but it's so important to um, to maintain the legacy of the youth talent pool. So thank you very much. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's been about a decade since the symphony has done it, I believe. And uh, like I said, you know, now is the time to really, um, you know, we talk about being hyper local. How do we create these opportunities? How do we recognize the incredible talent that's here um, in Hawaii and and continue to foster that, not just for each other, but so that we can showcase to the entire world um, what what treasure we have here. So mm. this might be a good time. You know, you took us, you know, from the beginning of, of your career as, as a young musician. Talk to us about the band. Oh. Uh, I am, you know, I have just been enthralled with the history uh, mm -hmm. because it's so, you know, growing up on the mainland and, you know, knowing European music history and, and uh, Western music, as it were, um, I was unaware of the diversity, the history, the importance that music played in Hawaii here. So if, pretend that I, I know nothing, what, take me through the history here and how the band played a part of that, this legacy that you're a part of now. Well, I'll, I'll try to narrow it down. Um, it's, it's quite a story. Uh, but in 1836, King Kamehameha III, Kaui Keauli, desired his own group of musicians. Um, and so he started what wasn't called the Royal Hawaiian Band at that time, but as a ruling monarch, he formed a group of musicians in 1836 that was the onset of what would later become the Royal Hawaiian Band. It went through some iterations. Um, some of their bandmasters either helped or even hurt the band at that time to a point where now King Kamehameha V wanted something else to happen. So he called some of his German friends in music and brought over from Prussia Heinrich Berger, Henry Berger, in 1872. And from that point on to present day, the band has become what it is because of the services that he's provided. Um, he came for four years. He was supposed to be here for four years, but he served for 43 years in service and became known, according to Queen Liliuokalani, the father of Hawaiian music. And that's because when he came, he heard the haunting sounds, the natural ability of Hawaiians to create music. Um, but it wasn't formalized. It wasn't put down in pen appropriately. It was usually done differently. They created music differently. They would create some kind of chant and then put some words to it to maintain a story that they're sharing. Mm -hmm. Henry Berger started to pen notes down for them and then they put words to notes and then the symbiotic relationship of creating music through both writing words and lyric at the same time came about. And he saved so much of Hawaii's music mm -hmm. and the Queen's music and the King's music. He penned it. He put it to the Royal Hawaiian Band music charts and compositions. And so much of what we are hearing today is because he did that. Without him and his service, I probably wouldn't even be here. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure if the band would have continued um, and it was always attached to some form of ruling monarchy at that time because it went through a variety of changes. One of those big changes, as you're very much familiar with, was when our queen in 1893 got deposed from her position. A very difficult, still difficult to this day. 
Um, and um, people, you know, will fight differently for their cause. But in 1893, because the Royal Hawaiian Band was attached to the monarchy, they were told to sign a letter not supporting Queen Liliuokalani. Now, she meant everything to them. That was their queen. The band was predominantly Hawaiian. So the majority of them had to leave the band. And there were only about two or three members at that time. Um, and they formed their own little group separately. Uh, it was difficult for Henry Berger to, to say bye to them, but he did. They went to the mainland to try to raise some support mm. for the queen, um, and it didn't work out. So they came back and joined whatever was there at that time. Uh, Henry Berger brought them back and reestablished the band. Um, and in 1895, when Hawaii went through that annexation to the transitional government, uh, it was so difficult for the band members to play the national anthem on the grounds of Iolani Palace. Mm -hmm. So they asked their bandmaster if they could be dismissed. And he let them. He said, go around the back. Stay back there. You don't have to be here for this time. It was so difficult for them. Um, they got through that. The ban was then, again, uh, attached to that ruling territorial government at that time. Has since transitioned through every other form of ruling government that Hawaii has gone through. Uh, and of, of course, Henry Berger finished uh, after his 43 years of service, um, the band had regained prominence and band masters that they would attract after that were also highly skilled and continued to pour their own initiatives on the band and whatever they could bring. Um, so it, it just kept getting better and better in different ways. And an interesting thing happened and the most important thing for us now, Prince Kuhio, after realizing the Hawaiians had lost their voice in 1893, became a delegate to Congress, a Republican delegate to Congress, for the sole purpose of maintaining Hawaii's voice somehow, because they had lost it. And in that process, he helped establish a city and county, because the gover governor at that time was appointed through US mm -hmm. territory. But uh, the mayor of a city had to be elected by the people. And the people were all Hawaiians. So they created the city in the early 1900s. And where did they put the band? Right in the city from its inception to where we are today as a department, a full-time department in the city and county of Honolulu, thanks to Jonah Kuhio, Prince Kuhio at that time. Um, it's, it, that's a, a, a small, quick capsulation of our, our, our history, but that's, that's kind of where we are now. Um, we, we love being part of the city. It, it fits well. We're a service organization. Um, we are, we're not used to people coming to us. We're more used to going out to wherever they're at, whether it be in educational institutions, adult daycares, Blaisdell Center outside for vaccinations, uh, malls, um, um, community events, government events, wherever, that, uh, the, the ban is usually there mm -hmm. serving to this day. Thanks primarily to King Kamehameha III, Kawikia Uli, for starting us, Henry Berger for his 43 years of service in 1872 when he started, and Prince Kuhio as well. And we are here today for that purpose. And I see Henry Berger's name when every time we play Hawaii Po, no. Hawaii Pono'i, he along with King David Kalakaua wrote Hawaii Pono'i for all of us. Um, and something you may or may not realize, but Henry Berger not only was prominent for the Royal Hawaiian Band, but he assisted in developing music throughout the island um, with Punahou School, with uh, Sacred Hearts, with Kamehameha, and he was the conductor of the group that later became 
the Honolulu Symphony. Wow. Henry Berger, not only did the Royal Hawaiian Band, but because of his work with the initial group of people who were string instrument players, mm -hmm. he conducted them, and they later became Honolulu Symphony. The second oldest orchestra west of... <laughs> west. I, I believe it's the Rockies. West yeah. of the Rockies. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Clark, can you tell us about the musical education in the royal families and how important it was here? Because, you know, I, you know, I, I grew up in France and they talk about Louis XIV and who invented the ballet, but we don't realize enough, you know, we know about Queen Lilio Kalani, but also King Kalakaua and Princess Like Like and, and how important musical education was and, and how they were, they wrote songs and wrote music. Absolutely, you said it all, Iggy, you said it best. Uh, it was, if you were part of the royal family, you did music. It was in, they went to the royal school, which is now royal elementary, right there in town. Uh, but they, they were born and raised in it. It became something that they were prominent in, prominent in. But not only that, they were smart music educators when they were young. They wanted to know the theory behind music, piano, and then writing music. Um, they would have these little family competitions because they were all, all gifted. We play all their music to this day in various forms. It's, take on, it's taken on different arrangements. But it wasn't uncommon for any member of the Royal Hawaiian family to get involved deeply in music. Our queen has, has uh, spent much of her life penning her deep thoughts and her pain through music. Um, and so has the, the, the kings as well. It's not, it's, it's not normal, but they were extremely gifted, very, very gifted. Um, and we all know to be a great musician, you have to be smart, right? <laughs> But the, the royal, the, ro the royal, excluding present company, of course, uh, but the, the royal family, very well educated, sharp people who were trained for music at a high level. Well, I, I have no doubt that to, to, in order to write music, you have to be smart. I don't know if all musicians have to be smart. I think, <laughs> I think we need to have some sort of musical IQ that's, that's important, more than being book smart or street Absolutely. smart. Absolutely. I don't know, if, well, Dave, any thoughts on, on that? I mean, I, you're kind of above us because you're <laughs> doing so many things, but. Uh. I'm, I'm gonna plead the fifth on this one. Um, <laughs> this seems like a dangerous door to go down at the moment. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about music history, music theory, these sorts of things, and I just have to ask, this is one of the lighter things that has come up on the show. If fixed dough, solfege, or movable dough, what's your, what's your preference? <laughs> Hawaiian. Hawaiian, oh, good, good. Okay. So, which oh. maybe uh, um, we can segue to our um, um, segment called uh, Off the Beaten Path. Yeah. Um, you, um, you mentioned that um, there's a song that's dear to you mm. that we may not know, but that ha is very important here. Can you tell us about it? Uh, yeah. Um, the Royal Hawaiian Band. Um, plays this, and I, I believe we could still even play it more often than we do, but it is a song called Kaulanana Pua, or Mele Ai Pohaku. And this song is, is very important to the Hawaiian community, um, but it's, it's our existence and what we claim as almost an anthem at times of patriotism. Because uh, in 1893, when the queen lost her, her country, mm -hmm. um, the band was a big part of that. I, I shared earlier, the members were not happy. They were, um, that, that's putting it lightly. They, um, they, they could not continue with their life. They, it was so important to them. Everything they did revolved around the monarchy and the queen and the band. Um, that they, they were so distraught, they went and sought um, advice and um, a musical song from Ellen Prendergast, who was the Queen's dear friend. And they basically wanted for her to share their story through a song. Um, and they didn't hold back. They were upset at the country coming in to take over their, their, their country. They were not going to sign the petition and they'd rather eat the stones of the land 
then submit to the upcoming government. Of course, everything has changed presently, right? But at that time, it was very different. Well, she put that to a song, to a pen, um, and it's, um, it, it tells their story. It tells the Royal Hawaiian Band story. We play it now as Mele Aipo Haku. And we, it's a, it starts off um, kind, of, kind of somber to share the feelings at that time of our members. It gets kind of majestic towards the end when uh, they, they really put a statement down and says, we will follow our queen. We will show the support. So, so, so that, so much so that the band members can have something in their power to claim their own. Um, and it has since gone through the Hawaiian community in, in varied ways. Um, it can be played up-tempo, so even hula halau dance it every now and then. But the, the, the message is still the same. Um, there have been projects where they do films and they go all over the mm -hmm. islands with prominent artists and they all take a little clip yep. of this and that and they sing that, that, that tune. Uh, but we know its purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's a tune that I think is a bit off the beaten path, per se, uh, and one that we probably should play more, but I think almost everybody should play more, just to bring back the reality of how powerful that message was at that time. So, Mele Aipohaku, the song of the rocks. The eat, we will not eat, we will not follow that leadership, we rather eat the, uh, the rocks of the island. So, Mele Aipohaku. Mele Aipohaku. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, my song doesn't have the same uh, wealth of history, but since this is about the Royal Hawaiian Band, I thought I would find a piece for once, not symphonic, but uh, that was written for saxophone. Oh. And um, the composer is French. His name is Eugène Boza, B-O-Z-Z-A. And he wrote a very sweet, melodic um, um, a piece called um, Aria for alto saxophone and piano. Uh -huh. But the truth is you can also play that piece for um, flute, on the flute or, or the clarinet and even on the violin and cello. So um, Aria for alto saxophone by Eugène Boza is very sweet. You'll have, uh, you know, you'll be sh shedding tears as soon as you hear it. Mm. Dave, did you have a, a St. Patrick? I, uh, I, hmm? I do, yeah, actually. Okay, let's see if we can follow <laughs> this one, okay. Uh, March 17th, 1749, what Handel oh, Oratorio yeah. was premiered? No, it wasn't the time. Solomon. Solomon. Mm. So, mm. what opens the third act? The queen of, the entrance of the queen of... Sheba. There you go. Yes, absolutely. The other, uh, today, actually, uh, it might have been last night, I was getting into the holiday spirit here, um, and there's a wonderful traditional Irish group called De, De Danon. Um, and all of a sudden, what came on was an Irish rendition of the Queen of Sheba on this <laughs> recording. And it blew my mind to think that, you know, the Messiah was, another one of Handel's oratorios was right. premiered in Dublin. And, you know, to think what traditional instruments would have sounded like in 1700s uh, in Ireland. And then to hear this recording of modern day traditional musicians playing Queen of Sheba, it just, it blew my mind. And it really, it, for me, it, it made everything connected. You know, the, the history uh, that, that you're talking about mm. with the band and how it relates to the symphony and how we can have music from 1750s England uh, in modern day on Irish instruments with bagpipes and fiddles. You know, it's, everything is, is connected mm. through everything. music. And it just, mm -hmm. uh, it just uh, we'll, we will definitely put that link on the webpage. You'll either love it or you'll hate it. And <laughs> I apologize, um, but... Uh, it's really, it's that connection, yes. that community. All, that, all that music is relevant yeah. and mm. universal. Mm. And, and I'll just, you know, say something that has no intellectual relationship, but uh, <laughs> uh, on Wednesdays and Tuesdays, I like to watch soccer in the morning, and there's a big event in Europe called the Champions League, and uh, there's an opening credit, uh, very powerful music, and all the soccer, levels in, soccer lovers in... in uh, 
in, in Europe, they, they, they sing that hymn of the Champions League, but that hymn is uh, nothing but a, an aria or an overture from a, a, an oratorio by uh, Handel. Mm. Um, but um, so it's, it's important to know um, the value of classical music, even, mm. even for the soccer fans. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, with that transition, uh, Clark, I, I, you, we mentioned about how the role of um, education. Uh, tell us about your foundation. Uh, I'm a bright kid foundation. Oh, thank you. Um, being born and raised in a musical family, my dad uh, was everything to many people. Um, rare that you can have so many gifts in one human being, um, artistic, and compassion and love and discipline. Um, but he did that for thousands of youth. Uh, and through the arts, you can touch people that way, I, I, I believe, not only as audience members, but on stage. Um, so, much so, that, so much so that they became family. He did that for many, many years at Castle High School. And then um, at Palikou Theater, we mentioned some of that earlier. But he passed away about five and a half years ago, um, and it, it was it was quite sad because he had the energy of what we thought was going to last another 10, 15 years. Um, hmm. But at the funeral, um, as I mentioned, the students thought it, it's not only fair for us to receive whatever he gave, so they started a foundation. And the purpose of the foundation is strictly to preserve his legacy. Um, we do a big production in the fall. He loved his big musical productions, uh, big orchestras and lots of sets and lights, and he just costumes, and he he's loved doing it as excellently as he possibly could. Um, and never at the expense, this is important for him, the discipline demanded was never at the expense of a relationship. He believed strongly in the love that would go through a discipline or, or through a, a compassion. Um, and it's through that kind of education and dedication to the art form that we center all that we do in the arts through the foundation. And uh, we started here at the Hawaii Theater um, with the opening um, in 2016 of, of the foundation. And we also give out scholarships to either edu people in education or the arts. We do a summer uh, workshop slash production, um, summer theater, theater uh, project for youth, for very young age, I believe it's even uh, 10 or 12, up to high school. Um, and that's every, every year. And we assist in various other um, audition-related exercises or whatever is needed to keep his legacy alive. His name kind of signifies him. He was extremely bright in many, many ways. Uh, and, and people fell in love with him, and we, and we don't want to let him go. We want to keep him around as long as we can. I know personally, um, he's very responsible for who I am, um, how I lead, um, my, my music background. Uh, and we want to try to do whatever we can to serve others and give others a chance to see a glimpse of what it may have been like to work with Ron Bright. And so you said that you actually have things coming up pretty soon? We do. Um, right here at Hawaii Theater. We'll be celebrating our, si our fifth anniversary of a foundation. It'll be the sixth year since his passing. And we're going to do a, a virtual live, virtual slash live performance here at Hawaii Theater on all, April 18th. Um, we're going to be, we, we are filming presently outside any of the big numbers so we can get more people involved, keeping their distance and getting creative, um, doing digital tracks and putting it on to the choreography. I mean, that's taking a lot of work, uh, but we're doing that in addition to about eight tunes that we're gonna be doing live right here on the stage with about a five piece rhythm section on uh, April 18th. That's coming up just to celebrate our five year anniversary, um, but to just allow his passion for the arts to continue. 
What a very great, what a great way to celebrate, uh, oh, oh. Your Father. That's really wonderful. We keep hearing virtual this, virtual that. Have you had any in-person live performances lately? Has the, have you had any glimpse of what an audience is going to be like as we return uh, here? Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> we, we actually have. Um, and now we've been doing these small ensembles since well, a, a little in the summer, but we had to stop again. So more consistently in September, o October, November, December area timeline. But for a musician, if you have a live audience, it makes a difference. It really does. Um, and this past Sunday was one of the first times for the past four or five months where we had a dedicated live audience. Uh, and we were at the Moana Hotel and we were playing for their 120th anniversary. We didn't think there was gonna be a live audience there. We just thought they're gonna be members sitting down eating and carousing or moving from one place to another like they normally do. But they had repositioned us. And when they did, if you're familiar with the Moana, you come through the beautiful lobby and there are the trees and uh, there, there are, uh, there's a veranda and just these rocking chairs and people can sit there. And all of a sudden, they just started showing up. They saw band members dressed in orange, yellow and white and they, what's going on? And we had our small ensembles, some of which were part of the symphony also as well, start to play. And they applauded. <laughs> there was an audience that gave feedback to musicians playing. And right away, you could just sense the different energy. There's something different. They may not say it, but I know I felt it being out there. And they just gave more and more and more. And it may have been 15, 20 people distance, but they were applauding and it was something. And it gave me hope. Mm. It gave me hope for all of us going back. And I, I truly believe when Symphony gets back, when the band gets back, when Hawaii's music gets back, it's going to be healing like no other time maybe in history because nobody does it better and then i may be biased but hawaii in celebrating music and impacting its culture mm -hmm. there are so many different ways hawaii does that and we need the symphony we need the band we need everybody to be working but there's going to be a healing time and get ready because you're going to you're, you're going to be busy <laughs> They're going to, I truly believe this, they're going to be coming out. It may not be right away upon the first opening of our community, but I believe Hawaii, because Hawaii does it so well, will be out there. The re reawakening. A reawakening, um, a I, healing, I, healing and a reawakening. Yeah. Clark, I should uh, mention that, uh, I, so I came in 97, I, sh I should uh, uh, acknowledge the, the two bandmasters before you mm -hmm. who, who um, uh, I, I met, uh, one is Aaron Mahi, mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, uh, after Aaron was, uh, was uh, Michael Nakasone. Yes. Um, so Aaron, Michael, yourself, you've been uh, um, uh, communicating with the city and county for so many years. Um, any advice you have for Dave, who's uh, only started to do that this past year? That's a loaded question. Remember what I said, is there anything you don't want to talk about? <laughs> uh, always be very nice to the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. That's very important. Um, I, I, oh, wow. Uh, you you, you kind of got me there. No, I would, I would um, un understand that they, the mayor, the managing director, um, the executive director of MOCA, yeah. um, Makanani Sala, uh, they all want Hawaii to go back to what Hawaii was. And they understand that its passion and its love is also rooted very deeply in music. Um, and so I think they want what's best for everybody. I think your continual approach to respect the fact that they have to make decisions that's best for the safety and well-being mm -hmm of the people are there, I know you know that. Um, and at the same time, I also know, because we go through it, that you have to tighten the screw every now and then to make aware of how important what we do is. Institutions. It's, it's very, very, very important. So that there's always a balance. Yeah. 
I think, in doing that. But they, they, they want what's best for us. They can't wait for us to get back to Oh, absolutely. And we, we certainly sense that. And, and I feel like we have a, a great renewed partnership with the city and the county. Fantastic. And I think we have a, a great group of people in there who just want to support music and culture and economics, because uh, that's a little bit of what we do as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. um, but really for the benefit of the community. And I think I'm so inspired. It's something that I talk about a lot, but hearing you talk about how the organization serves the community, mm -hmm. it's something that we talk a lot with the symphony here. How do are we of service to to our community here throughout Hawaii? So, um, I just I've I've enjoyed the opportunity to learn from you this mm -hmm. evening. And I normally ask this question, what does the future look like? But you just so eloquently told us uh, that I don't even have to ask the question. So I just I'm so grateful for your time and thank you very and, much. Uh, wonderful to to Iggy's picking up a green beer at the moment. So uh, <laughs> that must be the end of it here. Thank you, appreciate thank you so it. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next week. And uh, Iggy, cheers. Slancha. Sante.